In the last section, we, we talked about what the instantaneous rate of change of a function should be. Um, in fact, we talked about it fairly carefully, except we had a notion of limit that just was very fuzzy. We just, our notion of limit was just, well, as this gets really close to this, this should get really close to this. Today, we have to make that rigorous mathematics. And I'd like to say that we just put this off and never talk about it, except I wouldn't really like to say that, because if that's what I wanted to say, I wouldn't be talking about this right now. But um, it's kind of the foundation of calculus, the rigorous notion of limit. It's what lets you prove everything. And so you should see it at least once, um, what the definition of limit is. And then you don't have to use the definition much anymore if you're willing to believe the theorems that are proved about it that are contained in the section. We won't even cover all the results that are that are given in the section. It's too technical. And even the proofs of those are put into the technical matters section at the end of the chapter, but it's still too technical. But I do want to give you the big idea. So last time, we had the position function of something. I've, I've written a particle, but it could have been a car, it could have been a person, it could have been anything. The position of something moving on a straight line where you've laid out a coordinate axis. So suppose P of t is the position in meters of a particle at time t seconds. What, what we talked about last time was the instantaneous velocity at time, I, I just picked a time, at time two seconds. What should that mean? It should mean that you take the position at time two, and then you move some small amount in time. So the position at time two seconds plus something really small and you take the position there, and you take the change in position over the change in time. The change in time would be the 2 plus h minus 2, so it's just h. And you do that. I hope you see that there's a mistake there. That shouldn't be as t approaches 2. That should be as h approaches 0. We do that as the change in time, which is what h is, as that approaches 0, so that you're taking smaller and smaller time intervals, time intervals but always close to 2, so that you know what happens at time 2, not the average velocity between time 2 and time 2.1, or not the average velocity between time 2 and time 3, but you want this to get h to get as close as it can to 0, but that has no meaning. And so what, what I wrote last time is we want this notion of limit. We want what does it mean to write that the limit as h approaches 0 of p of 2 plus h minus p of 2 over h equals some number? And our kind of intuitive idea is but that's not rigorous, is that, well, this should mean that you tell me how close you want this quantity to be to this number, and I can tell you how close you need to make h to zero to make that happen. Um, so we say you know, we can make this arbitrarily close to L by picking h close enough to zero. But that's not math. And so we have to give a real definition for, and we don't care about just the position function, we care about any function. So the, the real question, I'll switch to y equals f of x, but you don't have to do this. Um, you've got some function. What does it mean to write the limit as x approaches b of f of x equals some number, where b doesn't even necessarily have to be in the domain of the function f. For instance, in the case we're most interested in, the case of the instantaneous rate of change of something, where you want the h to approach 0, 
Well, zero is not in the domain of this function. If you plug in h equals zero, you get zero down here. You get p of two minus p of two in the numerator, so you get zero over zero. That's undefined. h equals zero is not in the domain of this function. And so the case we're most interested in is what does it mean to write this even if we, we do care if b is in the domain of f of x, but even if b is not in the domain of f of x. And this is what, this is what I want to talk about in this section. It's, um, it is technical. It sounds <laughs> worse than it has to because it's classical to use Greek letters in the definition. And that's not going to change anytime soon, so might as well get used to it. So I'm, I'm going to write a careful definition of, of what limit means. Definition. The limit um, of f of x as x approaches b exists and is equal to L if and only if all right <laughs> here's where it gets a little bad what do we want it oh I should write this the the notation for this is what I wrote before the limit as x approaches b of f of x equals l um, by writing that it equals l you're in particular stating that the limit exists so, to say that there is a number such that the limit equals this means, in particular, the limit exists. Um, what do we want it to mean? It's, you tell me how close you want me to make f of x to l. Arbitrarily close. So, what does that mean? You specify some, some number greater than zero. Think of it as the distance, you know, how, the, within plus or minus that amount, you want f of x to be l. So maybe you think, ah, I give you 0 0.0000001. Can you make x close enough to b so that f of x is within plus or minus 0 0.00, however many zeros I said, plus or minus 0 0.000001, so that f of x is that within that of l. You know, it's l plus or minus that amount. So you specify that number that you're thinking of as small, but you can't really say a number is small, you just say it's any positive number at all, if and only if you give me that number. And that number is classically referred to as epsilon. For all epsilon greater than zero, this is how close you tell me you want me to make f of x to l. There exists. This is, this is how close I have to make x to being b to make f of x as close as you demand to l. There exists delta greater than zero. That is a lowercase delta. We've already looked at the uppercase delta for change in. That's an uppercase delta. That's a lowercase one. There exists delta greater than zero such that, such that what? Such that if x is, with, x is within delta of b, so <coughs> if, and the nice way to say that, the distance between two real numbers is the absolute value of the difference. That's the distance between x and b. We want to say that if that's less than delta, but possibly we don't, we don't want to say that um, it applies when x is b, because for instance, we don't want, for instance, where h is zero, because that would be undefined. So um, such that if this is true, and we want to say an x is unequal to b, 
The quick way to say that, since we already have this written, is to say if this is greater than zero, but that just means that x isn't b. That's just a handy way to say it, since we already have this written. But what we really mean is if this is true and x isn't b, then the distance between f of x and l is less than the specified epsilon. But that's the absolute value of the difference is less than epsilon. This is the definition of limit. And what it says is, no matter how close you tell me you want f of x to be to l, other than zero, you can specify any arbitrarily small amount that you want, that there exists this delta that I can produce, um, or that you can at least prove exists, that says that if x is within delta of b, but not equal to b, then f of x is the specified amount of close to L. Um, that's the definition of limit. You should see it once in a calculus class, if not more than once, but definitely you should see it once. How easy is it to use this definition? Not particularly easy. Um, proving things about limits is beyond what one would normally do in a classroom. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you do it, but let me, let me prove, for instance, one thing. Um, for instance, how bad is it, and this might look like I'm not doing anything, and that's part of the problem with proofs about limits. Um, I want to prove the limit as x approaches 1 of x plus 2 is, well, what should it be? Well, is, you should think is x gets close to 1, x plus 2 gets close to 1 plus 2. So this should be 3. But that's not a proof. Uh, and the proof requires us to go through the definition. So what do you have to do? You work your way backwards. You're supposed to show that for all epsilon that you can produce a delta, that puts you within, that makes x plus 2 be within epsilon of 3, you work backwards. You look at, okay, so I've got some epsilon. So here's how you think. You think backwards. We want to force this f of x minus that to be less than epsilon by putting some restriction on how close x is to 1. So think backwards. We want to look, we want to be able to make this happen. Here's the f of x minus what we're trying to show is the limit. We want to be able to force that to be less than epsilon. But that's true if and only if, well, I can subtract. This is true if and only if the absolute value of x minus 1 is less than epsilon. Oh, but that's, that's already a restriction on how close x has to be to 1. <laughs> so what does this show us? This shows us that for, to prove that the limit as x approaches 1 of x plus 2 equals 3, if you're following the definition, if you're following this definition, and someone gives you an epsilon, how do you select this delta? You can pick it to be the epsilon that they gave you. Delta is certainly allowed to depend on epsilon, and in general it will. So, um, yeah, just what this tells us is, yeah, we, somebody gives us an epsilon, we can produce that delta. It's the epsilon that they gave us. In other words, you know, given an epsilon greater than zero, we want to see how close x has to be to 1 to make this happen. This tells us that. So what about the condition that, yeah, if x, we said that x needs to be unequal to 1. That's part of the condition. It's if x satisfies this and is unequal to 1. But that's fine. So the real proof goes, the real forward proof goes, now that you've worked out what's a very easy example. You write the proof forwards. You suppose someone gave you an epsilon greater than zero. So 
suppose epsilon greater than zero is given. If you want to call your kind of bound on how close x has to be to b, if you still want to call it delta, you just say let delta equal epsilon. And then you write this in the forward direction. It's just, then it, well, it follows that if, if 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus 1 is less than epsilon, right, this, this says in particular that this absolute value is less than epsilon, then certainly x plus 2 minus 3 is less than epsilon because this quantity equals this one. But this is what we were trying to show. This is part of the problem. It may look to you like we haven't done anything. And part of that's because this is an easy example, and if we did a more complicated example, maybe it would look like there was something to do. On the other hand, it would be very complicated. So it's, um, there is this problem with showing things about limits. But let me just tell you some of the results, all of which have to be proved, but which should seem very, very believable. And certainly the proofs are in the book, and I'll let you look at them, but I won't go through them. So, <coughs> so one theorem, and this is so easy, you might not want to call it a theorem, call it a proposition or something. The, the limit as x approaches b of a constant is that constant. So what's an example of this? I mean that the limit as x approaches 7 of the number 5 is 5. Now, maybe that even looks nonsensical to you. 5 doesn't care what 7 does. We're saying suppose f of x is the constant function. It's always 5. Then as x gets close to 7, what does f of x gets, get close to? Well, f of x, f of x is always 5. So yes, it gets close to 5. Um, so yeah, the limit as x approaches 7 of 5 is 5. The limit as x approaches b of a constant is the constant. Almost as, as trivial is the limit as x approaches b of x. Let's see, as x gets really close to b, what does x get really close to? Uh, is this a trick question? A b, b, definitely b. Um, yes, that's true. Those may sound silly, but we're gonna use these as our basic building blocks once we have the next theorem. So, these are too simple to do us much good, but, but if we combine these with kind of an algebra of limits, kind of how you do algebra with limits, then suddenly we get a lot of limits that we know how to calculate. Theorem. So suppose this theorem tells you how to take um, complicated functions and break them up into easier pieces that you know the limits of and how to get the original limit from that knowledge. So suppose we have one function f of x and the limit as x approaches b of f of x is L1. The limit, um, well let's say, and the limit as x approaches b of a second function, g of x, is some limit L2. And let c be some real number. Then, a whole bunch of things that you would expect to be true are true, or at least I hope you'd expect them to be true. For instance, what should the limit 
as x approaches b of c times f of x b. Well, you should think as x gets, approaches b, f of x is approaching l1, so c times f of x should approach c times l1. Yes, that's true. It does. And 2. The limit as x approaches b of f of x plus g of x. Well, as x approaches b, f of x is approaching l1, g of x is approaching l2. What should f of x plus g of x approach? l1 plus l2. That's true. And I'm going to write similar rules for subtraction, multiplication, and division. Of course, with division, you have to make sure you don't divide by 0. But aside from that, um, you get the rules you would expect. Or, uh, you should expect that, too. So the limit as x approaches b of f of x minus g of x is, well, it's this limit minus that limit. So it's l1 minus l2. For the limit as x approaches b of f of x times g of x, you just multiply the limits. It's l1 times l2. And 5, if l2 is not 0, because I'm about to divide by it, the limit as x approaches b of f of x divided by g of x is l1 over l2. All of these are true, and you'd expect them to be true. Um, I, I, should, I should say how these are frequently written. Um, I've written that first these, this limit exists and is l1, this limit exists and is l2, but what you frequently see in books and in problems, and it is convenient, is just to write things like this, that it's c times this limit, and this is the limit as x approaches b of f of x plus the limit as x approaches b of g of x. This is what you frequently see written and certainly what we do write from time to time in problems. If, if you do this, you have to be careful because you need that these two individual limits exist and then this is true. If they don't exist, well, then the, the line is, is meaningless, but this limit might still exist. So these pieces might fail to exist and yet this limit exists. So you have to be very careful. If you break up a limit of something complicated into these smaller component pieces, um, you need to, at least at the end of the problem, realize that if those fail to exist, you shouldn't have written this equality in the first place. You just, you just need to know when you're doing limit problems, if the limits that you break things up into don't exist, then you weren't really allowed to break it up that way, and you need to approach the problem some other, some other way. All right, what do these give us? Well, if you combine them with this, the limit of a constant is the constant, and the limit of x is b, um, we, can, we can now do all polynomials. We can now talk about the limits of all polynomials or all rational functions, one polynomial divided by another polynomial. So for instance, <coughs> excuse me, What's the limit as x approaches 2 of the polynomial 3x squared plus 5x minus 7? Uh, you look at this and you go, limit might begin to seem a little silly to you because you look at this and you go, when x is really close to 2, this should be close to 3 times 2 squared, so that's 12 plus 10. Um, so 22 minus 7, 15. Is that right? Yes, it's right. And that's what those rules tell you. That, yeah, it says you can split up sums. Right? This rule 
says that the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits, provided we show that these individual limits exist in the end. Um, this says the limit of a product is the product of the limit. So the limit of the sum, you can split this up. I'll write this as plus a negative 7. Uh, oh, actually, we have the limit of the difference written as a separate. So we'll do this. Um, the fact that the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits, the limit of the difference is the difference of the limits, you can split this up. You have to apply the summation one there and the, the subtraction one there, but you get the limit as x approaches 2. That this should split up like this. like this, but then you apply the fact that, oh, this says the limit of a constant times a function, I can pull the constant out. It's the constant times the limit of the function without the constant there. So you can pull out the 3. This is 3 times the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared, which is x times x, plus the limit, or plus pull out the 5, plus 5 times the limit as x approaches 2 of x. This is the limit of a constant, which we already saw was just the constant, so just minus 7. And then you use that the limit as x approaches 2 of x is just 2, and then here it's the limit of a product, but we know that that's the product of the limit, so you'll split that up into the limit as x approaches 2 of x times the limit as x approaches 2 of x. But we know those, those are both 2. So at the end of the day, you do just get what you would have gotten if you plug 2 into the function. It looks like you just stick 2 in here, and that's, that is what you get. Which shouldn't surprise you, but it should make you wonder, what is the point of having limits? Um, so that is what you get. You get um, 12 plus 10 minus 7, so 22 minus 7, so 15. Um, right. And what's more, so we could do that for any polynomial. So all polynomials have this property. And this says that quotients of polynomials, those are called rational functions, quotients of polynomials also have this property that to get the limit, you just plug in the number as long as the denominator is not zero. So let me summarize that by saying a theorem. I'll say it again. Uh, a rational function means a quotient of two polynomials. So I guess I'll write a Q for a quotient. <coughs> so theorem, if Q of x is a rational function, a quotient of two polynomials, which includes just polynomials, because you could take the denominator just to be one. So if q of x is a, is a rational function, and b is in the domain, of q of x, then then what? Then what we've just said is, so b being in the domain means the denominator if, of this rational function is not zero when you put in b for x. But that means from our rules then that the limit as x approaches b of q of x is just q of b. It's what you get by just plugging in the b. This is not true for every function but it's true for most of the functions we deal with all the time. Um, all right, let me draw some pictures and draw some graphs and do some examples before we go any further. There is something else I should say, and it's it sounds like a technical detail, but it's an important technical detail. When I've written that 
x approaches b. I have been assuming that at least the domain of the function includes, well, some open interval around b, except possibly b itself. Such a thing is called a deleted neighborhood of b. And I, I have been assuming that it, you can actually approach b um, with x values that are in the domain of q from either side, um, from less than b and from greater than b. Um, you have to modify this slightly, and I will get to it at the end, but you have to talk about limits from the left or from the right if the domain of Q is uh, certain kinds of intervals. And if the domain of Q were really odd, then, um, then this limit wouldn't, well, we wouldn't do this in terms of limits at all, or we wouldn't talk about the limit from the left, from the right, or this thing, which is then referred to as the two-sided limit. All right, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So let's look at a, a function where it's not so clear what the limit is. How can you get such a thing from a rational function? Well, we could take the limit as we approach a point where the denominator is zero, for instance. So let's take, so here's an example. Suppose f of x is x squared minus four uh, let me say minus 9 over x minus 3. My question is, what is the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x? What we can't do is just plug in x equals 3, because that's not in the domain of this function. But our definition of limit only referred to x values near b, so within delta of b, but specifically excluded that we didn't care what happened exactly at b. Right? It was if, if 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus b is less than delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So we, there's only a, you only care about what happens for x's you know, close to b, but not including b. What does this mean for us? It means that if we could show that this function f of x equals some rational function that is defined at 3, except possibly when we're at x equals 3, then the limit would be the same, because the limit doesn't care exactly what happens when x equals b. So, what do we do? We, we do some algebra. This function equals, you can factor this as the difference of squares. It's x plus 3 over x minus 3. And it's divided by x minus 3. If x is not 3, and we're happy to assume that it's not, then you can cancel these x minus 3, and f of x equals x plus 3. That's not true when x equals 3. When x equals 3, this is undefined. And this is defined, but when x is not 3, these are equal, which means that this limit is the same as the limit as x approaches 3 of x plus 3. Oh, but this is a polynomial. <clears throat> and we know that to calculate, and this is a point in the domain of this polynomial, and we know that to calculate the limit, you just plug in the 3. So you get 6. So this is the kind of thing you do to calculate limits. You manipulate, certainly the kind of thing you do to calculate the limits that come up when you want derivatives, instantaneous rates of change. You, you manipulate what you've got to reduce it to something that, that exists when x equals b. And then hopefully you know, you have a theorem that tells you that, ah, when x, that you can calculate the limit of the thing you're talking about by just plugging in that x equals b. That's not true for all functions. I'll keep saying that. It is simply not true that to calculate the limit of a function, if the function is defined at b, you just plug in b. What is true is that that's true for almost all the functions that you've ever seen that have names. So, um, 
that weren't explicitly defined in pieces. So um, let me draw a picture of what's going on. The graph of this f of x, what does it look like? Well, it looks like the graph of x plus 3, except it's undefined when x equals 3. So we'll have y-intercept 3, slope 1. Um, it looks roughly like this. So what, what's happening in this limit? Well, really, this function is not defined when x is 3. So that's about there. So there's a hole in the graph right here. It looks like that, except it's undefined there. Where is the y-coordinate of that hole? 6. Right? And it's not a coincidence that this is our limit. I mean, people say sometimes that the limit fills in the hole in the graph, that you're looking at the y-coordinates as x gets close to 3. So you let x get close to 3. So here's 3. And you let your x-coordinates get close to there. What are the corresponding y-coordinates? They're the y-coordinates of these points. As your x-coordinates get closer and closer to 3, what does your y-coordinate get closer and closer to? This 6. Um, <coughs> And same thing here, as your x-coordinates approach 3 from the left, then um, your y-coordinates are doing this. And they're getting closer and closer to 6. And so this limit is 6. Um, this is how you see kind of limits graphically if the limit is going to exist. It just kind of fills in that hole in some functions. Um, of course, we could perversely define a function. We'll call it g of x. We'll define a, a function g of x that is x squared minus 9 over x minus 3 if x is unequal to 3. And just define it to be oh, 2 if x equals 3. Well, you can do this. It defines a function. It's a little odd because it means that, oh, you defined when x is 3, you just declared that the value of this function would be 2. So your graph looks like here's this line with a hole in it. And, oh, yes, there's this point hanging out down here. It looks like it was removed from the graph. Right, the limit <laughs> kind of fills in what ought to be there, and the, you can define it some other way. That's why I said that not all functions equal their limits. You can explicitly define a function in pieces like this, and then certainly the limit as x approaches 3 of g of x, well, as x approaches 3, we don't care what happens at exactly 3. And when x is unequal to 3, we get this, which is x plus 3, and the limit is what it was. It's 6. But that is completely unequal to g, the value of g at 3. When, g, when x is 3, we perhaps stupidly defined g of 3 to be 2, which isn't 6 today. So that, yeah, it's, um, there are functions that you don't, that have that in their domain, so 3 is in the domain of this g of x, and yet the limit doesn't equal what you get by sticking in x equals 3, but you should have this feeling that this is kind of made up just to have that property, but theorems in math are supposed to take care of all cases, and so you just have to be careful. Um, but this is such an important property to have, that if your point in the domain then the limit is what you get just by plugging in, that we give that a name. Um, so definition. Definition. If B is in the domain 
of f and the limit as x approaches b of f of x equals f of b, then we say that f is continuous at b. That f is continuous at b. Um, and if f is continuous at each point in its domain, we just say f is continuous without reference to a point. We say that f is continuous without reference to a point, if and only if f is continuous at each point in its domain. Um, I, I should remark again, there's a careful definition of continuity in the book that works regardless of how odd how strange the domain of F is. Right now, I am still assuming, well, I'm assuming that the domain of F is what's known as an open set, so that every point in the domain has an open interval around it that is also in the domain. If that is not the case, continuity, <clears throat> you have to change the definition of continuity slightly, for most, well, slightly. Um, I'll let you read the details in the book, although I will say something about it for left and right hand limits and special kinds of intervals, but for the general definition, I'll let you look in the book. It's technical, just like the definition of limit is technical. Um, so what have we said about rational functions? We've said rational functions are continuous. So it's a theorem. I've told you how to conclude it from our, algebra, our theorems for the algebra of limit, but it's a theorem. Rational functions are continuous. And now I'm about to make a much stronger statement. I've said a couple of times now that most of the functions that you've seen before have this property, that you calculate the limit just by plugging in uh, the x value. So you calculate the limit as x approaches b just by plugging in b if b is a point in the domain of the function. That's, that statement is saying that for most, I, I've apparently made the claim that for most of the functions you've seen, uh, they're continuous. That to calculate a limit, you simply plug in a point in the domain. And so then the problem comes down to, if you want to take limits involving those, to know whether you've got a point in the domain or not, and to manipulate what you've got to where it's a, a function you can take the limit of just by plugging in. So, so a, you want to reduce the function that you're dealing with to a continuous function that equals your function, except possibly when x equals b, because you want the function you're going to plug x equals b into to be defined at b, where the original one wasn't, just like we did a minute ago for x squared minus 9 over x minus 3. So what is the theorem? The theorem is that elementary functions are continuous. What is an elementary function? This is defined in the book. I can say it. I won't write it. But what's an elementary function? Elementary functions are polynomials, uh, trigonometric functions, inverse trigonometric functions, um, raising x to an arbitrary real power, uh, exponential functions, logarithmic functions, and any functions that you can get from the functions I just listed by, doing, by forming any finite combination of them by using uh, 
sums, differences, products, quotients, and compositions. Um, that, what I just named, in should include every function you've ever seen that wasn't explicitly defined in pieces. Um, it's, uh, in other words, what I'm saying is all of the functions that you've dealt with in math classes before that weren't explicitly defined in pieces were almost certainly elementary functions and that means to calculate their limit, they're, they're continuous, so that means to calculate their limits at a point in the domain, you simply plug in the number. This is not a theorem about, ah, here's how you calculate limits, you plug in x equals b. It's a theorem about the types of functions we deal with all the time. That they have that property. So you know, try to keep this straight. You don't, the definition of limit is not, oh, you, you reduce the thing to something, you reduce whatever you, the function you've got to something where you can plug in x equals b and then that's what you get for the limit. No, it's a theorem that most of the functions, that, or all the functions maybe, that you've ever seen have that property. Um, right. So, for instance, you know, what, what, does this include, you know, what if I want the limit as x approaches 4 of x to the x? Uh, is that an elementary function? Yes, it's an elementary function. You could write that, for instance, as the limit as x approaches 4 of, of, you know, write it as, I said we could use exponential functions and logarithms. So, the, the base x, well, that's the same as 10 to the log base 10 of x. And then, um, and then to the x, well, when you raise an exponent to an exponent, the exponents multiply. This is the same as the limit as x approaches 4 of 10 to the x times log base 10 of x. So is this an elementary function? Yes, because it's the composition of raising 10 to a power, so an exponential function, with the function that's x times log base 10 of x. But x is an elementary function. Log base 10 of x is an elementary function. And products of elementary functions are elementary. So yes, this is the limit. We're, x to the x is an elementary function. And so to calculate its limit, you at a point in its domain, you simply plug in the x value. You get 4 to the 4th. Uh, what's that? 16 squared, 256. This, this means that our calculations of limits are manageable if we have some elementary function that we can manipulate to where it equals another elementary function that has what we're approaching in its domain. Okay, I keep promising that I will talk about um, limits from the left and from the right. I, um, I suppose I should say one extra little thing that might sound awfully technical. It's limits are unique if they exist. What does that mean? We gave some definition of a limit that said it's a number L such that this is true. How do we know there's only one such L? Maybe it's possible that the limit as x approaches b of f of x is 5 and the limit as x approaches b of f of x is 17. How do we know that's not true? Well, it, it, it's a theorem. That limits are unique, which means there's only one, if it exists. The limit doesn't have to exist, and then there's none. But if there's a limit, there's only one. It's important that that's true, obviously, so that, so that really we know that when we say the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x, it is a the limit, not a limit. All right. Um, let me draw a couple of other pictures and talk about limits from the left and from the right, because they will come up. And continuity, when you have a function that's not defined to the left or to the right of a value. So let's return to our lobster function that we looked at in the last two sections. Um, 
we had the price of a lobster <coughs> as a function of the weight of the lobster. And again, I'm not going to look at all the cases that are in the section because it, I can make the point just by looking at one case. So we had that, so here's an example. We had the cost of a lobster as a function of its weight. This is in dollars and the weight was in pounds. And I'm not writing the entire function, but we had that it was seven dollars or seven times W dollars if W, the weight, was between uh, 1.5 and 2 pounds. And we had that it was 8 W dollars, so it's 8 dollars a pound, so 8 W is the total weight. If W is between 2 and 3, but not including 2. So we had this. What does the graph of this look like? Well, we looked at it before, and once again, I will exaggerate, um, kind of, I won't try to draw a line of slope 7 and slope 8 to scale. I'm just going to try to get across the point that I want. Um, so let's say that's, here's 1, here's 2, uh, we'll put 3, 3 up here. So, actually, let me make this longer. So, one, two, three. What's happening? Between 1.5 and 2, we've got C of W is 7W. That's a line of slope 7 that would pass through the origin if I drew it that long. I'm not going to attempt to correctly draw a line of slope 7. But so this is C of W equals 7W. So here's W. Here's the value of C. Um, at 1.5, even though we're not allowed, W is not allowed to be 1.5, if it were, we would get uh, 10.5. So this missing y coordinate is 10.5. And then um, when W, well here, eight, C of W equals 8W, if W were allowed to be 2, you'd be at 16, which I'm going to draw right here. And then you'd have a bigger slope of 8W, which I'm going to draw as much bigger just so it looks bigger. Um, and I'm going to run into my definition of C. Maybe I'll use a different color so it won't matter too much. So, So our function looks like, the graph of our function looks like this. The only details, or the only parts of the graph that I really care about are this break. Or that's the only one that I care about, is this break. And the question is, what happens as W approaches 2, but through values less than 2, and what happens as W gets close to 2, but through values greater than 2? This requires, to talk about this rigorously, requires a modification of our definition of limit, where you only allow W values that are less than 2, or you only allow W values that are greater than 2. I'm not going to give the technical definition of limits from the left or from the right. I'm going to appeal to your intuition, and I'll let you read that technical definition in the book. But it's a slight modification of what we did for what we would now call the two-sided limit after we have the one-sided limits. So what happens? Well, you can take the limit as x approaches 2 from the left. So this is, you read this, the limit as x approaches 2 from the left. You put this little minus sign, not in front of the 2, where it would mean a minus 2, but after it. So you mean through numbers slightly less than 2, which we picture as to the left. Limit as x approaches 2 from the, uh, as x approaches 2 from the left. 
And what is it? You, you can see it in, the, in this picture. The limit as x approaches 2 from the left. So your x values get <coughs> really close to 2. What are the corresponding y values doing? Well, the points on the graph are doing this. The y values are doing this. Clearly, as x gets cl closer to 2, closer and closer to 2, you are getting closer and closer to this point which is 2 plugged into 7w, so 14, uh, 7 times 2, 14. This limit, the limit, uh, yes, it's not x. Good. We're talking about a lobster function with a w here. A w here uh, from the left, right? Correct, not right. The limit is w approaches 2 from the left of c of w. What should it be? Uh, 2 times 7, 14. And that's what it is. And there's no mystery what's going on here, because for x by w values, if I've said x before, just I meant w in this example, when w is less than 2, you use this for, for your definition of c of w. And the limit of this as w approaches 2 is 14. Now, but we're only supposed to worry about what happens when w is less than 2. So you do use this formula. And this approach is 14. Um, what happens from the right? So analogously, we write the limit as w approaches 2 with a plus sign to mean from the right. This means through values slightly bigger than 2 of c of w. These are not the same. They, the, the limit from the right, uh, red chalk, you come in from the right, so you're looking at x values greater than 2. Uh, I said x again. w values greater than 2. And where are the corresponding y values? They're up here on the part of the curve that's 8w. So what does c of w approach? As w approaches 2 from the right, it approaches that missing value right there. It approaches this, which is 16. So the limit from the right is different from the limit from the left. These left and right limits are important to us. And this is an example of a case where they're different. And when they're different, in fact, um, the two-sided limit, the thing I defined as the limit, does not exist. This is an example of how the limit can fail to exist. If it, kind of, if it should be one thing from the left and something else from the right, then the, the limit without qualification simply doesn't exist. So the theorem is, the theorem, the limit as x approaches b, now it really is x, of f of x equals l, which means it exists and equals this real number l, if and only if the two one-sided limits exist, like they did here, and they're equal, if and only if the limit as x approaches b from the left, uh, from the left of f of x equals l, and the limit as x approaches b from the right of f of x equals the same number l. So in this example, that is not true. It's not true that they both equal the same l, so the two-sided limit did not exist in this example. Um, there's, uh, there's only one or a couple of other things I want to say, and that's what continuity means for a function that is, um, that's not defined to the right or to the left of some number. So you might think to yourself, well, where would we get such a dumb function? Well, in fact, we deal with such functions all the time, like square roots. Ah, I should have mentioned that when I mentioned elementary functions. Um, I didn't explicitly mention roots, but I said you could take x to arbitrary powers. So if you want the nth root, you raise to the 1 over n power. But let's look at the example of the square root of x. The domain of this, of this the domain, so the allowable x values, the x's have to be greater than or equal to 0. So 
the two-sided limit of this at zero does not exist simply because you can't approach zero and, and discuss this function. Can't approach zero from the left and discuss the function. Um, okay, but would we say that this is a continuous function at zero? The answer is yes. And so if a function is defined on a on a closed interval like this, so where there's a point, like a smallest point in the domain, for instance, like this one, um, then what do we mean when we say that f of x is continuous there? So at such a point, f of x is continuous at x equals 0 if and only if every place else the domain includes an open neighborhood around the point so our only problem is at 0 but f of x is continuous at x equals 0 if and only if the limit as x approaches 0 through its allowable values of f of x equals f of 0 so this is a, a modification of what I said continuity means for functions whose domains get cut off, it's if you can only approach through one si from one side, um, if the domain of your function lies to one side of the value you're approaching, then to say that the function is continuous there is just to say that the limit from that side um, exists and equals the value of the function there. So you need the, <laughs> you need the function to be defined at this point and you need it to be defined to the left or the right of that, but not on the other side. So uh, it would have to be on a closed interval of the form. You would have to have something that looks like uh, b, and then it could go out to infinity. So that's this example, like 0 to infinity. Or it could go from minus infinity to b. Or you could have you know, anything with b as, you know, it could go up here to some c, as long as it's got a closed, that the domain is a closed interval on one side, um, you only worry, continuity means what ha <laughs> continuity means the limit as x approaches b from the side that the domain is on equals what you get at b. Um, right. I said that this was the last thing that I wanted to say. That is not quite true. I, um, I want to give one more example because there is some uh, books vary on what they call continuous. Um, in modern mathematics, there is no serious debate about this, but there is some issue here because of what was classically meant by continuous. This is the graph of the function y equals 1 over x. Is this a continuous function? Well, it's a rational function. It's a quotient of polynomials. It's certainly an elementary function. It is continuous at each point in its domain, and that's what it means to be a continuous function. Yes, this is continuous. The, uh, one of the original motivations for defining continuity was that, oh, it should mean that the graph is unbroken, that you can draw it you know, in one kind of motion. Well, this graph is broken. It's in two pieces. In modern mathematical terms, that's a reflection of the fact not that this function is discontinuous, so not continuous, but that the domain of the function is not connected. The domain of the function is in two pieces. The real number is less than 0 and the real number is greater than 0, but it doesn't include 0. You will, you, if you look, you can probably find books that will say this function is not continuous. Um, that does not agree with modern terminology. This function is continuous. But even books that get that right, that say that this function is continuous, might have an issue with whether the function is discontinuous when x is 0 or not. Is this function discontinuous at x equals 0? Um, the convention I'm going to adopt 
is that this function is neither continuous nor discontinuous at zero. It's not defined at zero. There's no function to talk about. In my mind, it's like asking, is this function discontinuous at the planet Venus? Venus isn't in the domain of this function. You can't stick the planet Venus into here. It doesn't mean anything. What would it, you know, it doesn't mean anything to say it's continuous or discontinuous at the planet Venus. Well, zero is not in the domain. Um, so I will not, I will say that this function is neither continuous nor discontinuous at zero because there is no function to talk about. But if you look in other books, they may say that this function is discontinuous at zero. I just want you to be aware of the difference. Um, it, this won't come up very often because we'll just talk about it's a continuous function, which means continuous at each point in its domain. I realize this was a technical section. It's, uh, we haven't done, really, if, if you look at, if you read the section and if you look at the technical details in the technical matters section, you'll realize we've hardly done any technicalities at all. But next time, it'll be better because we'll get to come back to our notion of derivative and instantaneous rate of change now that we've got limit under our belts and we're comfortable with it. So next time, we'll be more intuition and more down-to-earth interesting problems.